Hi, welcome to Dr. Vanderveen's AP Chemistry Podcast. Tonight we're talking about combustion analysis. It's a very important problem type. This frequently show up on the AP Chemistry exam. And so our objectives with this podcast is to make sure everyone can successfully solve these problems. Um, they're very real world problems. This is the kind of data you might get if you were to send a sample off for elemental analysis. Um, and so you really do need to be able to do this. The other thing I wanted to point out is that if you can do these problems, most stoichiometry problems you're going to find um, you can handle after that point. Um, they pull together a, these problems pull together a lot of different kinds of skills, um, and so they're very good practice for our AP students. Um, the other thing I should mention is they're kind of long problems. Um, you have to learn to do them quickly, and so the only way to do that is to practice. There's no substitute for the practice that you need. All right. So let's go ahead and look at a typical problem. Now this is not an actual advanced placement problem. It's a problem I wrote, but it's meant to be in the same vein, a similar style, similar level of difficulty. Um, so here's the question. We have a compound that contains only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. All right. We have a 0.9722 gram sample of this compound. It burns an oxygen to produce 2.473 grams of CO2 and 0.3610 grams of water. All right, so we're asked to do a couple of things. The first thing we're asked to do is to calculate the individual masses of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in this original sample. And then what we need to do is use that information to find the empirical formula. We are not done with this particular problem. I've chosen to take it one step further. All right. We are now given the molar mass of the actual compound found by some independent method. We're given that information, and with that, we're now asked to find the true formula or the molecular formula of the compound. So let's take a moment and talk about our strategy. All right, you want to, especially if you're new to this kind of problem, you do want to make sure you know how to do it. Once you know, you can proceed very, very quickly. All right. So the first thing we want to do is to use factor label and calculate the grams of carbon and the grams of hydrogen present. All right. So we're going to get the grams of carbon from the CO2, the grams of H, H from the H2O. The next thing we want to do is find the grams of oxygen. Now, we can't calculate this with a factor label problem. Oxygen went into both products. Um, and so we're going to do this really by difference. All right, we're, we're going to do some simple subtraction. And that will give us the first part of our answer. All right. Once we have the grams, we can uh, turn everything into moles and use that to find the empirical formula. If you've forgotten how to do empirical formula problems, don't worry. We're going to go through that whole thing in this podcast. And finally, to do the second part of the question, we'll compare the molar masses to find the true formula. All right, so we're going to actually get started with the factor label first. At this point, if you don't have a periodic table, go get one. If you don't have your calculator, go get one. You need to have all these things. All right. So the first thing we'll do is we'll find the grams of carbon. Now, we were given in the problem that um, we had formed 2.473 uh, grams of CO2. We need to turn this into grams of carbon. All right. So let's set up our factor label. Um, we're going to end up doing three steps here. Um, I'm going to also be a little sloppy with my molar masses not going to keep all the decimals that are in my periodic table. I know I should, but it's too hard to write. <laughs> so I'm not going to. Um, so here's what we know. We know that for every 44 grams of CO2, that that, would, that gives us one mole of CO2. All right. We know, just looking at the formulas, for every one mole of CO2, I have one mole of carbon atoms. All right. And we can easily convert this into grams. And so for every one mole of carbon atoms, there are 12.01 grams of carbon. 
All right, so if you have your calculator handy, you can go ahead and do the math. All right, so 2.473 grams of CO2 um, times 12.01, and then we're going to divide by 44. Um, when we go through and do that all, I got 0 0.6750 grams of carbon. Great. All right, one thing down. We have a little more work to do here, uh, but our next step is going to be very, very similar. All right. So the next thing we need to do is to find the grams of hydrogen that went into making all the H2O. We're pretty much assuming here that you know all the CO2 came from the carbon in the original compound, and all the H hydrogen, all the water came from used all the hydrogen that was in that original compound. And so that's really the the premise that we're working on here. All right, so we're going to do something very similar um, with a factor label. Now, when you're comfortable with doing these problems, you can consolidate this factor label. Um, but for right now, we'll write it all out for completeness. So we know that for every 18 grams of water, that we have one mole of water. We know that for every one mole of H2O, we have two moles, sorry, so my pen is slipping out here, two moles of hydrogen atoms. And based on our periodic table, for every one mole of hydrogen atoms, that would be about 1.01 grams of hydrogen. All right, you can consolidate this side. Um, on a free response question, you are expected to show work to support your answer, but the readers know that there's more than one way to write this out. So as long as your work is consistent, you know, you've got the setup and you jump through the calculation, that's fine. All right, this is more than sufficient work. All right, but if you wanted to consolidate that, go right ahead. We go through, we do the calculation, and we get 0 0.04047 grams of hydrogen. All right, so we're well on our way. All right. The next thing we need to do to solve part A1 is we need to find the grams of oxygen. Well, as we mentioned earlier, we're doing this by subtraction. We know the original sample mass. It was 0.9722 grams. We're going to then subtract out the grams of carbon that reacted. We'll subtract out the grams of hydrogen that reacted. And assuming that all the difference was due to oxygen, and there weren't any errors, we're just ignoring all of that. All right, so we just found that there were 0 0.6750 grams of carbon, times 16, and we had 0 0.0, oops, that's a decimal, 0 0.04047 grams of hydrogen. And we're just going to do this math, all right? And that would give us the grams of oxygen. All right, when I did this out, I had 0.2567 grams of oxygen. We want to be fairly careful about sig figs with these problems. Since we're going to all whole number ratios, it's probably going to all come out in the wash anyway. Um, but try not to be too sloppy, all right? Uh, that's just going to not a good thing. Um, all right, what we need to do now that we have the grams of each element is we need to convert these grams of each element to moles of each element. Once we have the moles of each element, we're going to find the ratios between the moles. We're trying to, we're trying to turn this into a formula. So we want to find the lowest whole number ratios, and that will uh, give us ultimately a simpler formula or an empirical formula. All right, so let's do this four moles of carbon. We had 0 0.6750 grams of carbon. We're going to divide it by the molar mass of carbon, um, which is 12.01 grams per mole. This will give us moles of carbon. When I do this on my calculator and type everything in, I get 0.05. 620 moles of carbon. All right. 
We're going to do the same kind of thing for the hydrogen and the oxygen, just with different numbers. So for the hydrogen, I had 4.84047 grams. Dividing it by the molar mass of hydrogen, which is 1.01 .01 grams per mole. I do this out, and I get 0 0.04. 007 moles of hydrogen. And same thing for the oxygen. I had 0.2567 grams. I'm going to divide by the molar mass of oxygen. Alright. And I do that and I get 0.01. Oh, I just noticed this uh, typo here. It was a mistake here. Let me go back to zero. Nope. There should be a, there should be an extra O here. So let's cross this out and get this written down correctly. 0 0.04007. That's kind of important. Um those kinds of errors you want to just try and catch them before you get too far. So let's go back to our moles of oxygen. 0 0.01604 moles of oxygen. Alright, so we've got all this information right here. Alright, now you'll notice we don't have whole numbers. Alright, um, we need whole numbers to turn these into substrates. We need whole number ratios. So that's our next step. Alright, we're going to divide the moles by the smallest number of moles. We're trying to get ratios here. All right. And if you look at your information here that we just did on the last slide, it's clear that we have the smallest number of moles is the moles of oxygen. All right. And so we're going to divide everything by this number, 0 0.016604. And obviously that's going to be equal to 1. But we're going to do the same math with the other moles. We're trying to get ratios. So divide by 0.01604. We do that and that comes out to be 2.49 which is essentially 2.5. Do the same thing for the carbon. And we get 3.5. You're sitting there going, wait a minute. My mole ratios are 3.5, 2.5, and 1. And of course you can't have fractional subscripts in a formula. You can't have three and a half atoms of oxygen in a molecule or carbon. Uh, it just doesn't work. We have to have whole number ratios. So what we're going to do uh, in this problem is we're going to have to multiply our ratios by some integer to make everything work out. And it turns out to be 3.5, 2.5, and 1. I can multiply everything by 2 and make this work. So 3.5 times 2 comes out to be 7. 2.5 times 2 comes out to be 5. And 1 times 2 comes out to be 2. Which means we have successfully found the empirical formula. 6C7H5. O2. Great. We're almost done at this point. We're through the worst of the problem. All we have to do now is just wrap up that last bit. Alright, we need to find the true formula where we are given the actual molar mass. We were given that in the problem if you go back and look at that. All right. So again, let's think about our strategy here, what we need to do. We know that the true formula, which is sometimes called the molecular formula, is some whole number multiple of the, tr the empirical formula that we just found. Now this whole number multiple, we could be talking about one. We could put talking about any integer. We have to find that out with a little bit of math to do. All right. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the molar mass of the empirical formula we just found. All right. And based on that, we're going to compare it to the correct of the actual molar mass, we're going to find a ratio. We're going to actually divide them. And that will give us 
the whole number uh, multiple that we need to find the, the correct formula, the true formula of the subscript. So when we, what we'll do is when we find that ratio, we're going to multiply all the subscripts in the empirical formula by that whole number, and we'll be done. So we're, so we're uh, coming down to the end of this. All right. So what we need to do is find the molar mass of the empirical formula. We have seven carbons, each of a mass of 12. We have five hydrogens, each of a mass of about one, and two oxygens, each of, of a mass of about 16. When we add this all up, I get a molar mass of 121.1 grams per mole. All right. We were given the correct molar mass as being 242.2 grams per mole. We were given that information way back at the beginning. All right. We're going to divide that by the empirical formula's molar mass. And the reason we're doing that, it'll give us the whole number multiple that we need. All right, 242 divided by 121 comes out to be 2, which is great. That's exactly, uh, that's a very nice way for it to work out. All right, so what this means is the true formula is two times as big as the empirical formula. And so we come to the end of our problem, we can state that the true formula is C14H10O4. Now, you may need to do some extra practice with these problems, but I assure you, with practice, these problems will go very, very quickly. You'll know what to do, and you'll have great success.